All right, let's do it now. There he is. I can't see him. There he is with that glorious morning beard. How are you doing, Mr. Paul Felder? <laughs> I'm good. How are you, man? I'm good. I'm, I'm very delighted to catch up with you. I appreciate you making time for us. Now, I did see on social media from your account, not just generally, so I can trust the reliability of this. Do, do you have a doctor's appointment today yes. about your arm? So what's the deal there? Well, this is my, it'll be my third x-ray. The first one obviously being when they realized it was broken. Then I had one after the surgery to see if the plate, you know, was holding up and, and doing what it's supposed to do. And then today should be another one, another x-ray and uh, see if the bone's healing the way it's supposed to. And my doctor told me if today goes the way they expected to go this this splint that i'm wearing should uh should be off and i should start a little bit of pt and rehab on the arm getting the strength back and get the flexibility in my wrist and we'll see hope so hope fingers crossed that that's uh that's good news in my, on my x-ray today but let's say you get good news and we certainly hope that you do when would you anticipate a return to the octagon when i was at the pi um Heather, who was working on my arm and helping just, you know, do some scraping and, and get some some blood flow in there, said, uh, realistically, if everything goes well, de December is possible. Wow. That is crazy quick. Okay, that's not nearly as long as I thought. Yeah, man. I mean, there's a metal plate in there, dude. So the doctor told me, he's like, this, this isn't going anywhere. He's just, we want to make sure that the bone that's attached to the plate where it was broken is fully healed before you start getting too crazy. But that, that was the reason we went with having the plate put in versus maybe trying to line it up and letting it heal in a cast, because that would have taken significantly longer to just let it heal on its own. Okay. So let's get to the actual injury itself for folks who may not know this. It happened during your fight with Mike Perry at UFC 226. Was it the spinning back fist that did it? It's got to be, man. I've watched that fight uh, uh, at least 15 times, and the only thing I see that would have caused that kind of a break is that spinning back fist that hit off it like hit off the top of Mike's head. Okay. So, uh, and, and got a hard did, head. Yeah, it certainly does. Did you feel it immediately? Did you? Did it impact your ability to compete with that hand? I'm, I'm, there must have been some kind of uh, you know, hindrance with that. I knew something was wrong, but at first I just thought my arm was stiff and sore. And then in between the first and second round in the corner, I was making a, trying to make a fist because I couldn't make a full fist because the bone was snapped and I could feel crunching. I could feel the bones grinding together in my wrist. That sounds normal. That's how I knew something was very wrong. <laughs> All right. So I've been thinking about a lot of that fight. I, I rewatched it the other day. What is your impression of that fight? Yeah, you had the injury, uh, and it didn't go your way. It was a very tough fight. He's a tough guy, too. I know you expected to win, but going back from there, what is the lesson there? Is 170 in the right weight class? Why'd you, why did the result – why why did it happen that way? See, the, un the unfortunate thing, I think, for me is if that had gone well, I, I do think 70 is very much a, a possibility. I don't think – size or strength was really why things went wrong. I think it was just a tough fight and circumstances didn't go my way. I got hurt, but, uh, uh, I, I really feel I could compete at, at that weight class, but I do also a, a big part of me thinks I can really still make a run, uh, at the top at 155. Um, I was on a three fight winning streak and now it's like, I took a loss, but I only took a loss at 170. So I still haven't lost in over a year at at 155. So I'm I'm hoping that I got to talk to my coaches and and my manager and things like that. But I, I I I was really leaning towards 70 leading up to that fight, and, and then now I really want to try to make one more really strong run at getting into the top five. And I, you know, I would love to fight for that belt someday, man. The, the 170 thing, I had two thoughts about it, and I don't want to be that Wawa guy who gave you unsolicited, terrible advice, which, by the way, I want to, I want to you, follow up with. You can. <laughs> I'll listen to you. You I will listen to. I know who you are. You know this game. It's the guy at Wawa. I had no idea who I was either. He didn't even know who I was, and people were getting on me like, oh, he's a fan. I'm like, no, he wasn't. 
he just asked me what happened when I explained it. He's like, oh, yeah, man, you can't be throwing spinning back fists. It happens all the time. It used to happen to me back when I fought, you know, uh, bare not whatever the guy said to me, which was complete crap. So, so yes, so, I'll listen to your advice. Go ahead. Which I'll get in a minute. Hold on, look at this Wawa guy. So you go in there, and you're just – you're not bothering anybody. You're ordering up your meatball sub with whatever you put on it. <laughs> and this guy – uh, how did he know, like, was your face still fucked up? Like, how did he know you were a UFC fighter if he didn't know who you were? My face was still banged up, but more importantly, I had this on. So he's like, what happened? What happened to your wing, bro? And I was like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I hate explaining to people who don't know what's going on. I'm, I'm going to just start saying I tripped and, and fell and landed on my wrist. But So I explained to him, I was like, well, I'm a fighter. And, you know, I had a fight and I threw a spinning back fist and it, it broke. And the guy gave me his whole history on why I shouldn't be throwing spinning back. He, he still didn't realize that I was a current, you know, UFC fighter, that if you actually followed the sport, you would probably know not only who I was, but that fight that, that just happened on a pay-per-view on one of the biggest cards of the year with Cormier and Stipe. And it's like, he, he didn't even know. So I was like, you don't even know what's going on in the UFC right now, yet alone giving me advice on what I should be throwing in, in the sport today. Well, how was the sub? Was it still delicious? You know, the messed up part is I don't even think I was getting a sandwich that day. I think I just got like uh, some water and like a protein bar or something. So <laughs> I didn't even get to indulge in a, in a delicious hoagie or a, a meatball sandwich. All right. Well, look back to one. By, by the way, I was just thinking about that. Like Conor McGregor, you know, one of the most successful popular fighters, independent of, uh, you know, boxing or MMA, I bet he gets it all the time. I don't know about from Wawa uh, technicians, but you can imagine oh how many people God. must come up to him. Like when he lost to Diaz, can you imagine how many people must have said something to him? That you can't win with this stuff. Bro, why'd you tap, bro? Well, because yeah. he was choking me. That's why I tapped. <laughs> all right, back to you. Here was my thought about 170. Number one, I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea, especially if you have time to, like, get your body weight totally right for 170 rather than taking a yes. fight on short notice. But this was what I noticed. I don't think you don't have big power. I do think you have big power, but Mike Perry just wore it better than some of your 155 opponents. Maybe that's a Mike Perry yeah. thing. Maybe that's a 170 thing, but those are my two thoughts. What do you, what do you make of that? Yeah, I, I, I think he's used to getting hit by bigger guys. He, he's competed at that weight class. He's a, he's tough. Like you said, to begin with, I mean, Mike's, a beast no matter what division he's in. And on top of that, yeah, he's, he's used to the bigger guys and, uh, you know, he, he's taken punishment from guys even bigger than me. So I, I'm going to see that a lot. If I go to 170, where guys won't fall down or, or, you know, cause I hit him with some shots that maybe if that was a, a 55 or who's smaller than Mike, or he's not used to that. I feel like some of those right hands would have at least dropped a lot of 55 ers Oh. And then, and then, and then preparing your body for 170. Sorry, no, no worries. If you take a 170 fight, but now you have time, like you know, let's say uh, 10 weeks to prepare, would you bulk up a little bit? Yeah, yeah. I was, I was. Uh, it's tough, man, because I was like, I was waking up two weeks out from the the Vic fight in in Idaho, still at like 180, 182, two weeks out. So I, I was struggling to get down for 55, but I'm not huge to be making weight for 70. That's why that 15 pound gap kind of throws things off. Whereas I had to start eating just so that I wasn't walking into fight week at, you know, 178, 179, just from work workouts, I get down to that. No problem. You know? So if I knew ahead of time, I'd probably be walking around lean and bigger in the nineties. Whereas right now it's, it's tough for me to do that. That's why I'm thinking 55 might end up being back on the table just because since the hand injury, I haven't been able to lift as much either. Mm. So the weight that I do have on is weight. I can lose quickly just from burning fat. Got it. All right. I want to use your analytical powers and I hope that you get good news from the doctor. Appreciate your time today. Let's look ahead. Now you were actually supposed to fight uh, James Vick coming up this weekend at UFC Lincoln. Instead, it's going to be James Vick taking on Justin Gaethje. Uh, your impressions of who might win there? Uh-oh. Did we lose him? Ching. Oh, there we go. <laughs> That's a, 
That's a bad way to freeze on Skype. See if we can get them uh, either back on Skype or on the phone. Oh, oh right when we had the uh, analysis stuff. Gee, it. You know what? When are cell phones n when are cell phones not going to suck? That's what I want to know. You ever think about that? It's like cell phones have enabled talk radio, which is my normal course of business, to thrive because you can get virtually anybody anywhere. I think he's in a car or something, right? But at the same time, the technology is just not that good. That we think it's that good. It's not that good. Granted, we are making uh, incredible demands upon it. Where I'm trying to look at this gentleman through his cell phone. Uh, back on the Skype or what? Yes. All right, let's go back to Mr. Felder on the Skype machine. There he is. Sorry about that. All right, you were saying Vic versus Gaethje. What do you think about uh, who might win there? Well, I, I think if Vic uses his range properly and can stay away and avoid those leg kicks and keep it at bay, it might force Justin to use his wrestling a little bit. And if he shoots in on Vic, I, I think it's trouble, and I think Vic might be able to, to secure a submission, man. I think he's just so long and rangy that he's going to be able to um, avoid a lot of the power punches of Gaethje. He's just got to watch the leg kick. So hopefully that's something he's been pre preparing for so he can avoid getting his legs chopped down because you see Gaethje's able to do that to guys that are shorter. So imagine Vic's long legs, who's obviously got to have skinnier legs to be fighting at 155 at 6'3". So I think it's going to be a battle of can Gaethje land the leg kicks and hurt him or can Vic keep his jab on him, look for that uppercut, or look for a submission. So I, I give the slight edge to, to Vic in this one. I don't know which way to lean on the Justin Gaethje scenario, which is as follows. Is it smart to incorporate wrestling because he is so good at it? We've seen defensively he can use it to great effect to keep the fight standing. Or has he so ingrained a fighting style that going outside of that to what he's historically done would be aberrant for him to the point it might throw off his offense. Where do you lean on that equation? Yeah, I think if he decides on this fight to really use his wrestling, it could be could be a problem for him just because of the submission threat that Vic possesses with, with the, the guillotines and Darce chokes and things like that. He's so long that even if you have a good shot, once he gets his arms around your neck, it's almost you know impossible to defend a guy like that. Then that takes us to some other lightweight fights that are happening on the calendar. i got to get your impressions uh, very quickly. We've talked a lot about it before. Habib versus Connor. Let me re-pitch it to you as follows. Uh, what is Connor's most undervalued strength? What is Habib's most undervalued strength? I think for Habib, uh, I think we, we talk about how he's – not as good on the feed. He has all these problems, but his pressure is so unrelenting that he's able to land a lot of big punches on guys that we, we kind of stop talking about because he gets to take down. He uses his ground and pound. He's gotten submissions, but he's in your face. He landed a lot of shots on, on Edson Barboza, who's clearly a better striker, but because of the takedown threat, because of the ground and pound and the pressure, guys have to backpedal. They have to worry about his wrestling and it opens up for big strikes. So one of the things that we could see that might throw people off is Khabib might be able to land some punches and, and some strikes because you know that he's going to be coming to take you down and you have to worry about that anytime you're fighting that guy. So I, I think uh, his boxing is kind of completely forgotten about, even though he's improved it and it is getting better. And for, for Connor, his takedown defense, I mean, who's taken him down and really controlled him there other than when Diaz got the submission, but Connor initiated that wrestling exchange anyway. So I think his, his control on the feet and Mendez obviously got him down too, but he did have a bum knee going into that fight, which we found out later on and did almost no wrestling. So I think Connor's ability to, to keep the fight on the feet and, and uh, stay at range is some, well, that's something we, we know he's good at, but I think his wrestling and his jujitsu is underrated. Certainly. And then Dustin Poirier, Nate Diaz. That's a really interesting one for me, and I'll tell you why. It's because overall, I think Dustin is the more complete fighter and has more ways to win. And I do think skills win fights. But the fight, yeah. play, the, 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 the places in a, in a fight he likes to be, boxing at range or grappling on the ground, boy, just so happens to be that Nate Diaz is awesome there. And in a three-round contest, zero issues with cardio anyway in a five-round, but especially in a three-round, that is to me a very competitive fight. Yeah, I agree. I think um, 
you're right. Where where Dustin is really good is where's you know Nate thrives. And uh, same with Dustin. They're both tough guys that like to bang it out a little bit, and that's that's Nate's world. So we'll see. But I think I agree. D- Poirier is definitely the the cleaner striker. He's got good wrestling, but Nate, he's a freak, man. He's he takes shots. He hangs in there and, and he finds a way to win and, and he's got great submissions and judo throws. So that's a fight that if, if everything works out and they end up a- actually fighting, um, that's going to be a hell of a fight. I think that's going to be a three round bloodbath, to be honest with you. You did two, maybe three, but I certainly saw you doing two of the weeks for the Dana White Tuesday Night Contender Series. Phenomenal job. You really have come into your own with this gig and I was really happy to see you back there. What is something you are seeing with the guys who are the next generation of fighters that maybe some of us, when we're watching, don't pick up on? Like, yes, they're well, all, they're well rounded, okay, but you've now done that gig a lot. What are you seeing from them? Did we lose them again? Right. I think these kids are learning business too. You know, they know how to act in there. They know how to promote themselves better than guys. Maybe when I was first getting into the UFC, they. They, they know how to hype themselves up. And uh, am I still there? Yep. All right. Sorry. thought maybe I was lost again. No, you're good. Uh, yeah. The, they all, um, they, they seem to have a lot more confidence, these guys coming in than, than guys at that level outside of the UFC would have normally had maybe three, four or five years ago. It's these guys know they belong there. And now they have to go through a longer road to get to the UFC than I did when, when I got signed, I mean, these guys normally used to be able to fight for a regional promotion that the UFC kind of looked to for a feeder. And now they've got those guys have to now come and fight another guy that's at that same level level and UFC ready potentially and, um, and battle it out on the contender series. So I think that they're more UFC ready than they used to be or ever have been at, at this point in, um, in MMA. Yeah. You know, what's crazy. That Sadiq Yusuf fight. I forgot the gentleman who he fought. But they could have easily handed out a contract to the loser in that fight. Oh yeah, uh, bro. When 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 I saw that fight matched up, and I looked up, I think Mike, Mike, it was Mike something that he fought, and yeah. that kid was a, an absolute stud. And uh, in in the highlights of building up to his fight, he was training with um, Mike Perry, and he's like throwing him around and landing shots. So I mean, that kid, that's how good that kid is. Even at one forty five, he's competing with UFC welterweights and uh, it just, yeah, Sadiq's just that good too. I mean, coming into this one, I knew how good uh, Sadiq Yusuf was. I'd seen him before. I'd seen him live, knock a guy out. So uh, he's a guy I've been aware of for a long time. And when he got on the contender series and he was the underdog, I I couldn't believe it. Uh, Before you go, do you know when you're commentating, not so much for the contender series as the season is over, but when you're going to be next in the commentary booth next week, Next week, for real? Wait, wait, you yeah. mean Lincoln? Yeah. Oh, very good. And who are you doing it with? Who's your partner? Uh, Fitzgerald. Oh, what a great team! Boy, he is so talented. That guy. He had no background in MMA. He has transitioned just fine. Yeah, he um, he really, you know, dove into it. Um, watches all the fights, does a ton of research, asks questions. Uh, did a little bit of training when he now that he's out in Vegas at Syndicate. I think he was taking some Muay Thai classes and things like that. So he's all in, man. He um, he's a sports guy, you know. He's one of those guys that embraced the sport, and once he got that job, he he dove into MMA and learning all aspects of it, and uh, it's it's paying off. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I know the last fight didn't go your way, but uh, you've been phenomenal in the commentary booth, and whether it's at 155 or 170, I know you still have some glory days yet. Paul, thank you so much for your time, and uh, if I ever find that guy in Wawa, I'll tell him how to make his sandwich better or something, I don't know. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to that one this week. I'm going to be out that way anyway. I'm hoping <laughs> me and my man can have a little conversation. All right, good luck with the convo. I appreciate it, my friend. Thank you. All right, thank you, guys. There he goes.